Good evening. If we might uh, get started. We're here tonight to talk about the U.S. political outlook uh, over the next six to eight years. Uh, lest we forget, uh, George W. Bush still has three years to serve as president. Indeed, he has more time over a thousand days than John F. Kennedy had during his, during his entire presidency. Even so, there's an enormous amount of speculation in Washington and well beyond about who will be the next president and how will America change. Uh, and it's thought by many pros that uh, the next president might be here on this stage tonight. So, <laughs> uh, the, uh, <clears throat> it's also thought that we might have two candidates who represent their parties, they carry their party's banners uh, into the next election on this stage tonight. And if you think far enough ahead, long enough ahead, with the youngest member of the U.S. Senate on this stage tonight, we might be looking at two or three elections down the road. So we'll have to see how that goes. Let me introduce them very briefly. Um, I think most of you know from his previous appearances here, Senator John McCain. You perhaps don't know that in Vietnam, our POWs were held longer in captivity than in any other American war. John McCain was in captivity from 1967 through 1973. He entered the United States Congress in 1982 and entered the United States Senate in 1986, so this is your 20th year there. John Sununu, to uh, my left, this is his first visit, J Senator John Sununu. At 41, he is the youngest member of the United States Senate. He came to Washington in 1996 and then entered the Senate four years ago. And by the way, since New Hampshire is so often the gateway uh, to the White House, we'll be looking for you for some early and savvy thoughts about how that might unfold uh, this year. As you, many of you know from previous visits also, his dad was the governor of New Hampshire and served as the chief of staff uh, to President H.W. Bush. On my far right there is Mark Warner, who is making his first visit to Davos along with John Sununu. Uh, and Governor Warner is, a, is one of the most watched men in the Democratic Party today, in part because the recent polls have shown that if the election were held now and the two candidates were Senator McCain and Senator Clinton, currently in one poll, Senator McCain is running 16 points ahead. That has prompted some Democrats to think, hmm, what might our alternative be? <clears throat> Entered Mark Warner. He has just served four years, he was term limited, served four years as governor of Virginia. Uh, and after a, a start that he would probably call, you know, a learning experience, uh, he finished with an enor enormous uh, uh, momentum and uh, left office as one of the most popular Senate, uh, governors in the history of Virginia, 70% support, and his uh, lieutenant governor, a Democrat, has just won election in that red state. So this, is a, the, the, this panel very much represents the America, America's future, and I'm anxious, and I hope you are, uh, to hear from them about where we're going. Our thought is that we might talk here among ourselves for about 40 minutes or so, and then we'd like to open this up for your questions, thoughts, or brickbats, be that come as you may. But let me start by asking each of you, and we'll go in alphabetical order. Rather than, we could start with Hamas, but let me, let me ask a broader question. As you look ahead, what are the most important goals we ought to have in America, and what are the prospects for getting there over the next six to eight years? Senator McCain. Well, thank you, David, and thank you for moderating this panel, and it's a pleasure to be with Governor Warner, who did a great job in the state of Virginia and obviously knows a great deal about the issues of the day and the smartest member of the United States Senate. Uh, he tells me that often, Senator <laughs> Sununu. Uh, uh, I, 
I, I think some of the challenges are the obvious, the war on terror. The transcendent issue for a long period of time will be the war on terror. In the short term, um, it's to identify and eradicate the enemies of the West and everything we stand for and believe in. And the long-term solution, obviously, is to remove the causes of this rise in Islamic extremism, which is able to recruit and motivate people to go out and take their own lives while they take the lives of others, the most difficult kind of enemy that, that we face. And that obviously is an ideological struggle and one which has to do with hope and opportunity. As long as there's millions of young men standing on street corners in the Middle East with no job, no hope, and no opportunity, or maybe if they live in a suburb of Paris, or maybe even live in London, in the case of a couple, then there's going to be young people who are motivated to commit acts of terror. So we've got to provide them with jobs and hopes and opportunities and an ideology which I think can prevail over time. And that is one that's based on Judeo-Christian and Islamic principles. We all know that these people have taken an honorable religion and perverted it to their own ends. Domestically, and I will only mention one, there are many challenges that we face. We're seeing today our dependence on foreign oil and, and other threats to our economy. But I would say, David, overall, the theme has got to be reform. We've got to reform the institutions of government. Today, I saw a poll that showed the approval rating of, of Congress is at 29 percent. I've not seen numbers that are lower uh, on the part of the American people. We're in the middle of a big scandal, so we have to reform the way we do business. But we've got to reform Social Security. Young Americans are not going to receive the same benefits that present-day retirees have, period. The, I stood fifth from the bottom of my class at the Naval Academy, but I can do the math on that. Uh, reform, reform of health care. There's unfunded liabilities, according to the Government Accountability Office, of some $40 trillion associated with Medicare. And we've just had a stunning failure in an attempt to implement what should have been very easy for government, and that is to provide Medicare prescription, prescription drugs for seniors who are making a choice between eating and buying drugs. So we have to reform the major institutions of government and the major programs that were intended to take care of those in our society who could not carry, care for themselves. Thank you. We'll come back. Senator Sununu. Thank you. I would begin by underscoring the uh, domestically the significance of those unfunded liabilities. Uh, as, as Senator McCain indicated, $40 trillion, primarily unfunded liabilities associated with Social Security and Medicare. And that would represent uh, an unprecedented transfer of wealth between generations, uh, effectively taking enormous resources and thus opportunity from future generations and transferring it to uh, the baby boom, boom generation as they age. Uh, those unfunded liabilities uh, uh, pose probably the greatest threat to uh, the stability of our budget and the stability of our economy uh, over the next 20 years or so uh, domestically and they have to be dealt with. And, and we're at a, a point now where it's, it's a, a hackneyed expression, but the longer we wait, the worse it will get. And it really does cry out for strong, bold leadership. And, and the kind of leadership that's not, willing, uh, not, uh, not afraid to fail the first time or the second time because the pursuit of the problem um, and, and solving the problem is so important. A second d domestic issue that I would highlight uh, is our, our tax code. A and I think as more than anything, uh, the problems in the U.S. tax code 
undermine our global competitiveness. We have a tax code that is not border adjustable in the way that most uh, developed countries' tax codes are, uh, whether it's a VAT or another border adjustable system. That puts all exports in the United States at a competitive disadvantage. Uh, and that naturally uh, held, holds a bias against manufacturing firms and capital intensive firms. We also have a tax code that uh, doesn't provide much uh, support or conversely discriminates against capital intensive firms and manufacturing firms because of our high levels of taxation on capital. Uh, and finally, the complexity in the tax code feeds a lot of the problems we see that emerging in the lobbying scandals. When you have a tax code that is that complex, uh, it becomes easier and easier or, or more and more uh, likely to see changes, manipulations, or specific uh, carve-outs for favored companies, favored industries, or favored activities. And, and that's very, very unhealthy and can pose some very long-term threats for the country. Um, one final issue that I'll, I'll speak to very briefly is trade. Uh, in the long term, uh, this would uh, help to address some of the international uh, and national security issues that Senator McCain talked about. Uh, what is happening now, the negotiations in, in the Doha round are extremely important. Uh, creating an FTA, a free trade, uh, uh, Western Hemisphere, uh, a free trade area as well, and then expanding some of our bilateral pacts. Uh, enhanced trade supports, of course, uh, U.S. domestic, but international security by providing greater levels of economic growth and dealing with the issues of poverty and health crises that create instability and thereby uh, create uh, risks to uh, the security of the United States and our allies. And uh, this, the, these are all three areas uh, which, if addressed, will provide benefits not just in the near term but uh, on a time scale measured in decades. Thank you. Governor Warren. Thank you, David. And let me first of all say it's an honor to be up here with Senator McCain and Senator Sununu. And David, I appreciate uh, the generous introduction, particularly for a guy who's now been unemployed for 11 days um, since I just finished up my term as governor. Um, I would frame it a little bit differently than in both, both the senators in that I made the transition from a relatively successful career in business for 20 years into politics because I didn't think most policymakers understood the kind of fundamental changes, mostly wrought by technology, that were kind of steaming at us whether we liked it or not. I believe that uh, some of the, the world issues related to uh, uh, the rise of fundamentalism in many religions are in some way a reaction to some of this fundamental change. I think for America, and my hope and prayer is that America continues to be a, you know, lead the world uh, in many ways, but it's we have to, I think, have a uh, a real willingness to step up and address some of these issues. I think it starts with uh, America's ability to compete, uh, our education system, uh, our willingness to uh, really make sure that every American is equipped with the knowledge-based skills to compete. I believe that morphs into the whole question of health care, which no longer is simply about a fairness issue of the 45 million plus Americans who don't have health care, but more and more comes again back to competitiveness. That has to be linked with fiscal policy that uh, uh, as a governor, um, I, I kind of look sometimes askew at the federal government. I know both Senator Sununu and Senator McCain share this view, so this is not a, a partisan issue, but um, you know, it is just so irresponsible for our kids and grandkids, the, the fact that we have not been willing to have the, the political will to step up and, um, and take on fiscal issues. Uh, that was one of the things we did very aggressively in my tenure in Virginia in a bipartisan fashion. Clearly, energy security goes right to the heart of, of, of issues as uh, uh, related to the Middle East and, again, America's role in, in combating those folks who uh, uh, want to change the West way of life. Again, I believe energy security is inexorably linked with, uh, with some of those issues. So my sense is there, there would be enormous consensus probably amongst us amongst what the issues are the United States faces. What we need is substantive action. We need results-driven, metrics-driven action. Um, unfortunately, and again, Senator McCain touched on part of this uh, with his calls and appropriate calls, I think, for reform, um, we don't see that coming out of, uh, coming out of the Washington 
So uh, my hope is that uh, through these kind of conversations, we can kind of move some of those ideas forward. Thank you. <clears throat> Good. Well, it's obvious it's a huge agenda. Uh, let's come back, if we might, to the international foreign policy and start with the war on terror. Uh, Senator McCain, you have uh, argued uh, strongly that this is a war that America must win. Can we win it? Are we, uh, are we, gonna, are we looking toward winding up something, with something short of victory? Well, I hope not, because I read what Zarqawi writes. I pay attention to bin Laden and his credo of not only destruction of, of Iraq, as far as we know it, but also um, of the United States of America. You know, I, I have stated sometimes the surprise of some that this is more important than the Vietnam conflict was, because after we lost in Vietnam, we left. Ho Chi Minh's successors, consolidated power, et cetera. And we've now emerged with some kind of fairly decent relationship with Vietnam. We leave Iraq, in my opinion, my opinion, we lose Iraq and leave it in chaos. Not only does it have profound implications for stability in the Middle East, but they have said, I didn't, I'm not saying it, they said, they're coming after us. They will come to our shores and to our country to try and destroy our way of life because of their religious zeal that all the world should follow into their version of Islamic uh, religion. So I think that it's not a question of whether we can win, I think it's a question that we must win. But if, if they're unable to form a government with great Sunni participation and they're unwilling to reform their constitution, how do we get from here to victory? I don't know. I think that we have done a great deal. As you know, I have advocated a robust U.S. military presence until their military is capable of assuming responsibilities for their own security as well as law enforcement. But having said that, the formation of this Constitution, the formation of this government, whether changes are going to be made so that the Sunnis can feel that they are included and part of the process is something that's largely in the hands of the Iraqis. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how that's going to come out. That's why I think the next six months to a year are, are vital in the whole scenario of Iraq. And uh, Senator Warren, do you think the Democrats ought to now pull back from their push for a quick exit, let this play out a little longer? Or what would you urge your part upon your party? Well, first of all, I'm, I don't think the I don't think this always breaks down on a Democrat-Republican divide by any means. I don't think, though, uh, in the United States, we ought to simply be refighting how we got into this war. Uh, I think that same application ought to be made to the rest of the world. I know there was a great deal of resistance uh, in the rest of the world against uh, the actions that we and, and others took. But it is in the, not only America's best interest, but it is in the world's best interest that we have a peaceful, successful Iraq. Um, what I believe is uh, this period, as Senator McCain has indicated, with the formation of the new government, how we exert as much influence as possible in ensuring that the Sunnis, both at the leadership level and equally important at the man on the street level, feel that they have a stake both in this new government and in this new Iraq. Uh, I think as well we need to uh, find ways to encourage more regional um, interest in making sure that Iraq is successful. And obviously, uh, amongst uh, particularly other folks in, in Europe. Uh, this needs to be a shared responsibility at this point. Now, that will require, um, I, I, I think, some fresh thinking from, from everyone, but I, I believe uh, um, we must finish. I also believe that the Iraq um, circumstance has shown up. Um, um, one thing that I saw again as governor, and as I sent off my National Guard troops and had them, had them return, we have uh, our military and the military of the British and others performed admirably. But um, one thing that we clearly, I don't believe, fully thought through was what happens after we take out the command and control of the enemy. We often now have asked our military sometimes on that whole question of helping build civil society or get the water and power and uh, the day-to-day -day life of the regular Iraqi to see that improvement. We've asked them to do things that um, um, in the long run, may not have been the appropriate role. This may be an opening for us, uh, again, for the United States, 
with our friends around the rest of the world uh, to take more of an active role and learn how we do uh, post-conflict resolution. Clearly, there's lessons that should and must be learned from the Iraqi, the Iraqi circumstance. Senator Sununu, uh, 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 Senator McCain said, look, the next six months are crucial. We've got to see, and it's mostly up to the Iraqis. What's the sense of the Senate and you think of this administration if after those six months things aren't, haven't come together, what do we do? What's next? Um, <clears throat> that, that's a hypothetical built on a hypothetical. You know, uh, hypothetically saying if we don't no. have certain things in place in six months, then uh, what would we do? I, I can't tell you because I can't tell you precisely what the conditions would be six months from now. But I think it is a true statement that this needs to be a, a, a progress-driven process, a milestone-driven process right. that leads to a stable representational government in Iraq, uh, Iraqi people being able to provide for their own security and the commitment to the institutions of civil society that, uh, that Governor Warner talked about. And, and I think those are big challenges but realistic goals. And those are the goals that should be pursued if you, if you believe that, as some people did at the beginning of this process, that establishing those elements, a representational government, a, 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 a constitution, are not possible in the Arab world, then I, I think the you know, likelihood for failure is great. But if you believe that they can be achieved, they can be implemented, and if you look at the, the participation in the, the election process in Iraq, uh, in the Palestinian elections as well, uh, then I think you have to walk away with at least a modest level of optimism that there is a real desire for a representational voice for a democratic process and for a consistent and fair process without going too far afield into the elections and the Palestinian territories. It was clearly a movement for or movement toward reform of domestic institutions, questions of corruption, questions of government, questions of, of infrastructure that people were responding to. And, and I think that, again, at, a, at least at some level, is an indication of a real desire for civil society, representational government, and, and a, a right to self-determination. Does the president, is, is the president able to count on congressional support through for another year, year and a half, no matter how this comes out? In other words, so he has a chance to wrestle with this in a variety of ways. Uh, I, I, it's difficult to say. I think for six months. Uh, I think for six months, you cannot escape the fact that we will have a congressional election at the end of, next, uh, at the end of this year, right. and that in that climate, uh, members of the House and those members of the Senate that are up for election uh, will, will begin to make some calculations based on where they think popular sentiment might be and what they think might be in their own uh, interest in, uh, in their re-election effort. Well, I'm, I, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, Senator McCain, I, it, it's been quite striking how rapidly the issue uh, of Iran, of Iran has, has risen on, on, and, and on public sentiment in America. The, there's a survey that just came out of Fox that said, that asked people, what's the number one threat to America? And it's Iran. Uh, and, and people said in this survey, they thought Iran posed a greater danger to us now than, than, than Iraq did at the beginning, before that war started. And there was a very high support for using military force. Could I just make a couple of comments sure. on, the, on the previous situation? One is that um, the American people are sort of schizophrenic on the issue of Iraq as I read it. If you ask if you want immediate pullout, the majority say no. Right. If you say you want to withdraw, the majority say yes. Right. So it's, 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 uh, Americans are not exactly sure uh, <laughs> uh, about this situation. The, the other thing I want to mention real quick, you know, classic insurgencies are Ho Chi Minh, Chairman Mao. The gorilla swims through the water, swims through the right. people as the fish through the water, and you gain the support of the people, etc. These guys, you have to go all the way back to the Bolsheviks. They want to kill everybody. They go into schools and kill the teachers. They kill everybody, and they want to be the last one standing. I don't believe, over time, history shows that that is successful. On Iran, But it also shows you've got to hang in it for a long time. Yes, yes. There has been no counterinsurgency that has uh, succeeded, that hasn't been taken a long time. 
but that doesn't bother me. I just want the Iraqis to be able to do it rather than Americans to be able to do it and, and build up their military and their law enforcement. I'm generally pleased with the progress of the military. I'm generally unpleased by the, by the training and equipping of the law enforcement. You notice when casualties, many times police recruits are the first target uh, of the insurgents. I don't think that's an accident. On Iran, very quickly, I think it's the greatest threat we faced outside the overall war on terror since the end of the Cold War. Uh, we have a, a country which is dedicated to the extinction, in their words, of, of the state of Israel that is now about to acquire at least the technology which would mean a tipping point that they would be in an irreversible path to uh, build uh, uh, nuclear weapons. Um, it's a very tough. We saw the face of the regime when the president came, of, of Iran came to the United Nations and talked about extinguishing the state of Israel. Um, I was here last year when, on a panel with the foreign minister of Iran. Very pleasant, mild-mannered guy, very enjoyable. Has no power whatsoever. So um, I, th I think this is a great, great and grave threat. and. Uh, I think this administration is handling it as well as it can possibly be handled with there's very few good options. And I, I continue to hope that the Russians and the Chinese will understand that an eventual outcome of a nuclear armed Iran poses a danger over time to them as it does to the entire world. Play out for us in your mind how this might unfold and where the key points are going to be and ultimately where we might, the ultimate hard decision that might be required. I, obviously, the logical next step is to go to the Security Council. We've been a little reluctant to do that, as you well know, because right. of the uh, fact that we might get a veto from China slash uh, Russia. I think that uh, it was, I was sorry that the, what seemed to be a reasonable proposal of the Russians concerning reprocessed fuel was apparently turned down by the uh, Iranians. Uh, we have to keep the military option as the last option, but not take it off the table. Otherwise, I'm not sure how we have any significant uh, leverage. So the next step, of course, is the Security Council. If, uh, then we get into hypotheticals, but one of them is if Russia slash China don't at least abstain, if not join us, then we're going to have to look for a coalition of people who will be involved. Then the question is, is how effective can those sanctions be? And I think that that's a very legitimate question. But it seems to me you exhaust every possible option. And then, of course, the $64 question is, is how long does Israel sit by uh, if they are threatened, uh, if they feel that they are about to be attacked themselves? It's, it's, as I say, it's complex. It's difficult. There's no good option. But it is probably the most difficult challenge we've faced. And what sort of window do you ha think we have? I'd say certainly a few months. I'd, I'd, it's, it's, I can't answer that. I really don't know, but I don't think we have an unlimited amount of time. Is, is, it a, is the tough point, though, when they get the knowledge of how to build one or when they actually get one? The Israelis are arguing it's when they get the knowledge, and that's when the window starts closing. If I were living in Israel, I would say that that's the tipping point as well. But I would say that from our standpoint, probably it's when they actually acquire one. Historically, we've always underestimated the progress of the acquisition of these weapons, whether it be North Korea or, or any other nation that we've faced similar challenges from. I, 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 a lot of times I think I know answers and can come up with scenarios as to how we can succeed, et cetera. This one is really very, very difficult. On, on this one, uh, Governor Warner, do you think the, uh, where do you think the Democrats should go in terms of their uh, policy choices? Well, I think, first of all, there is, a, to my knowledge, an absolute common thread that a nuclear-armed Iran is a threat to the world, not just to Israel and the United States, but to the world. Um, and I believe that, uh, I mean, I concur with Senator McCain in terms of the next few steps. I believe the the window may be a little longer. I, you know, I can see uh, this process, and uh, 
I actually thought that the Russian proposal was still alive a little bit, and actually I think China endorsed it today. Um, I'm not sure whether the Iranians have actually rejected it, but it, that will take some time to play out. The sanctions will take some time to play out. My concern is, you know, what happens perhaps two years, a year and a half, two years down the line, and with you know, potentially a, a government in Israel that uh, uh, may be still not finding its sea leg, but clearly with uh, new political parties on the forefront, the Kadima, Kadima party, you know, will that make the situation even more volatile? Um, I clearly think this is an area that uh, the American foreign policy must be consistent and relentless. This is not something that we can focus on now and walk away from it and come back in a few months. And you know, part of the challenge, again, uh, the folks that I've talked to, you know, it's all over the lot um, about when Iran will have the true capability to create that nuclear weapon. And part of the concern, I think, in the, the balance of the world will be uh, if the United States or um, and even a greater um, part of the West says, now is the time, will the rest of the world believe us? Hmm. Hmm. Uh, uh, Governor Snuno, I'm, I'm, I'm curious again about the Congress, whether the Congress is going to in, put a lot of pressure on the uh, White House uh, to be very tough on this, and whether the President, Congress is also going to put a lot of pressure on the President to be tough on Hamas. Uh, well, let me deal with the Iranian issue first. Uh, I believe this is an area where Congress is more inclined to, uh, in the near term, over the next uh, uh, two to three months, defer to a certain degree uh, to the President, to the Secretary of, of State, in part because there's, uh, I think, bipartisan support for the, the approach that's being taken now uh, to see if we have the ability to work through uh, the Russians uh, to formulate a system where, whereby they gain control of the, uh, the fuel chain, where, where, whether it's through reprocessing or taking ownership of, of the fuel itself. I mean, there are a couple of ideas that are on the table and, uh, and that I, I think still remain, remain viable. Uh, Senator McCain has laid out the options with regard to the Security Council and sanctions. Um, and, and this is an, an area where there's been great uh, well, not great, very good coordination between the United States and, and the EU. So I, I think th this is one where there'll be um, some deference to the president. And, and I, don't, I don't imagine Congress pushing the administration in a, in a s specific direction. You might see uh, hearings, uh, members of Congress that have different ideas, but I don't see Congress coalescing behind an, a, an, a specific approach that differs in a material way from the, uh, the approach the administration has taken so far. And on Hamas? I think we'll know shortly uh, what kind of a government is structured, what kind of a role Fatah will play in that government, and, uh, and what kind of, a, of, of an initial response uh, the quartet uh, 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 takes to, uh, to the new government. Uh, with power comes real responsibility. And I, I think there are two areas where, as a result of an election where 70 percent of the Pal Palestinian people voted, Hamas has a very specific responsibility at this time. One is domestically, uh, to respond in areas of social services, corruption, um, and uh, job creation that uh, the, the Palestinian people uh, have called for action, uh, not just in this election, but in previous elections. And I think those, those questions and those concerns, more than anything, not, not only, but more than anything, uh, what, what drove the, the success of Hamas in the elections. And then there's also a responsibility to deal in, uh, with Israel. Whether or I don't think that Israel uh, they they won't and they they shouldn't uh, engage in a peace process negotiation as such. But there are questions regarding movement of people, movement of goods, security uh, around Gaza that the Palestinian government has responsibility for, and they have to coordinate their actions with Israel. 
in, in, in order to deal with those questions. And it's in Israel's direct interest to make sure that there is security uh, in Gaza now that the withdrawal is complete, that there are uh, provisions for movement of goods or movement of people that are essential to uh, the economy in the Palestinian territories, whether there is any movement on a, a so-called peace process or not. And the way that the new government deals in those two areas, the domestic responsibility and the, the necessity of some interaction with the Israeli government, I think will go a long way toward um, uh, showing us what potential there might be, what future potential there might be for, for further strengthening of, uh, of discussions, relations, or other activity. Could I just add sure. one point, David? I think the United States government has to make it very clear there will be no aid or assistance to the Palestinian Authority until they renounce their commitment to the destruction of Israel. I don't see how you can expect any kind of progress of any kind except confrontation if the party in power still says it's dedicated to the extinction of its neighbor. Mm -hmm. And again, I, I think on this issue there is very broad bipartisan consensus. Um, my hope, and again, there's uh, two points. One is it wasn't that many years back that Hamas said even participating in elections would be a violation of their tenets. So they've, there has been some movement there. And I heard from one individual earlier today um, um, when we were talking about the focus on democratization is there now, should there be the second look at democratization? Clearly, there was enormous frustration amongst the Palestinians about the corruption and lack of personal security that was being delivered by the Palestinian Authority. Um, at least working through a, an election process may have prevented uh, what I, I understand today. There's, Senator McCain mentioned some violence in the streets. What might have erupted into a, an all-out war if there had not been some way for the Palestinian people to have their views expressed? Well, I'm, I'm just curious about this, Senator McCain. We've, we've, uh, there have been three elections in that part of the world in the last year, in Iran, in Iraq and now among the Palestinians. And the results from a Western point of view have hardly been encouraging. <laughs> I can't disagree with that assumption. We've also had an enormous success in Ukraine, Kyrgyzstan, Georgia, Lebanon. Right. And so what, so what, what does it tell uh, us though, about our approach I, to that part of the world? I think that democracy is Winston Churchill's description of it. And I think it's incredibly difficult and I think that we cannot discount the influence of uh, this, this religious extremism or Islamic uh, religious uh, impact uh, on the people and those who are voting. And I think that um, it's a very difficult proposition, but I think it's better that they have elections than have repressive governments, which we have found in the past eventually explode in violence and in the kind of uh, regime that the Shah of Iran left us in, Iran, uh, there, in that David, I, 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 clearly the, the uh, uh, election in Iran and, and the elections um, of Hamas are, are not good, um, as you describe. But I don't think it's fair to suggest that the process in Iraq has been unsuccessful to date had peaceful elections with very high turnout, uh, a number of different parties sending a very broad spectrum of individuals uh, to uh, a representational parliament that in includes women, includes secular parties, certainly includes some fundamentalists with which we should all be concerned. But the, the process in Lebanon that, that John mentioned been successful. The, the election process in Afghanistan, I think, has been about as successful as, as uh, you, you could hope. So, I mean, I, I think it is it's a slight misrepresentation to, uh, to point to uh, those elections uh, that, that haven't res resulted in uh, a situation with which we're comfortable and say uh, nowhere in the Middle East, Arab world, or Muslim world uh, have successful elections taken place. So you can, you can go back even further to the elections in Indonesia, uh, the, uh, which I believe is the largest Muslim country in the world, um, and, uh, and, and find success as well. So I, I, I think it's at least 
uh, a glass half full. David, right. let me just add one other, but you know, I think we need to continue forward with the democratization process, but I think it needs to be paired with, a, with I think, a more sophisticated and actually a, hopefully a broader alliance-based approach on building civil society. Mm -hmm. you know, rule of law, organizations, um, some sense of civil rights and civil responsibility. And I think there have been times in, uh, that the focus has been almost on elections without sufficient additional focus on the others. And that is a, a process that I'm not sure we or in America, or for that matter, I'm not sure anybody in the world has fully sorted through. It is going to be something that's going to require not only governmental action, it's going to require NGOs, it's going to require you know, the kind of Davos-type concept of bringing all of the parties to the table, business and others. Yep. And that's something that um, arguably in the last five or six different military incursions, not only under President Bush, but under President Clinton as well, you know, simply removing the prior regime's leadership doesn't necessarily mean you've then got a peaceful, successful country. Let me and also point out the Iranian elections were not a democratic process. They disqualified any moderate or <laughs> other than the most conservative uh, candidates, but Mark is also right. But again, I point at Afghanistan. This is a country where they routinely took women into the soccer stadium in Kabul and hung them from the goalpost because they showed their ankle. So now we have a fundamentally functioning democracy, which by the way, Mark, they are building these institutions. Rule of, election is the easiest part of democracy. Rule of law is the hardest part. And it takes time. The United States of America had to fight a bloody war 100 years after we were formed to determine what kind of a nation we were going to be. So in this day and age, our expectations are heightened and we want things to happen overnight, but it's extremely difficult. And I, again, refer, uh, Afghanistan is not only an example of, of, of the kind of progress you can make, but it's also an example of NATO involvement in a very, very positive way and other nations. Uh, in the interest of moving on, let me, let, me go, let me return to the issue that both you and uh, uh, Governor Warner raised as, as central to the future of the United States, that's energy security. Uh, a lot of these problems would be easier with, with more energy security, more energy independence. How do we break, we, the President did get an energy bill through this last year, but in terms of, and, and, and he believes it was a significant achievement, as do many in his party, but in terms of gaining real energy security, how do we break the deadlock in Washington and bring the kind of reforms that allow, would allow a more comprehensive solution based on both production and conservation? Well, it's clear that we are now much more vulnerable than we were some years ago to any disruption of oil supplies. And when you look around the world, in Venezuela, things are uncertain at best with a very at best described mercurial leader. Bolivia just elected a president who evoked echoes of Che Guevara in his inaugural speech. I never thought I'd hear that. And then, of course, we have this Iranian situation. We have the Russians having cut off oil supplies to Ukraine, at least for a period of time. And it'll be interesting to see what this whole explosion of the gas lines uh, were. And so we find vulnerabilities and the oil supplies, the major suppliers of oil to, and natural gas to the United States. I think it calls for almost emergency planning. The last energy bill had some good parts in it, of course. It also had some huge gifts to the oil and gas industry who were very powerful in their lobby in Washington. So uh, without, uh, by the way, John Sununu has a, a lot of good ideas on this, which I would be eager to listen to again, but um, nuclear power in the short run has to be part of any equation that is going to give us an energy supply very quickly and also address the issue of climate change, which I am very, very deeply, most deeply concerned about. The single issue that I think is that we haven't addressed in any way that's the most important of the future of the planet. And nuclear power 
is, got, is clean and it's doable and it's technological feasible, technologically feasible. Politically, it's very dangerous. We have to explain to the American people that 20 percent of our energy right now is supplied by nuclear power. Those power plants are going out of business. Are we going to replace them with fossil fuel utilities? I hope not. I think he was segueing to you well, as well. It's nice of John to say that uh, he appreciates my idea on the, this issue, uh, given that my opposition to the energy bill came to naught. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm very skeptical of the federal government being able to create a proscriptive energy policy that really makes a meaningful difference in these areas. Um, where I think an, an energy policy as such needs to be focused is on one, encouraging the greatest possible diversity of uh, production and supply. And that means ending the, the distortions that currently exist in our federal statute, uh, most predominantly in our tax code where we create very narrow, specific provisions to provide tax benefits to certain types of technology, certain companies, certain industries, uh, which is actually counterproductive in the long run to having diversity of supply. We also provide direct uh, subsidies to certain kinds of research, uh, certain kinds of equipment, and again, that uh, it may be a fashionable idea today to spend money in a particular area of energy research, but it distorts the marketplace and makes it less likely that in the long run we'll have a truly diverse uh, uh, set of supplies that include nuclear and solar, geothermal, uh, coal, gas, and, and fossil technologies that continue to improve their emissions technology. So you need diversity of supply and what we have typically, as members of Congress, called energy policy is often weighted against diversity of supply. Second, you need to encourage infrastructure. People with money take risks, build infrastructure necessary to provide different kinds of energy to, uh, to, to homes, to businesses, to transport it around the country and, and such. So you, you, if you were going to have a policy, it should be a policy that encourages the risk-taking risk associated with that infrastructure and that capital. And it, it means having a level playing field, but there are areas, I, I come back to taxes on capital, uh, depreciation, uh, the, the, what we choose as tax regimes in those areas makes a big difference as to whether someone is willing to take or, uh, the risk associated with building new transmission or new gas pipeline or, or a new LNG facility. And uh, which brings us to, to regulation which is also uh, something that is a barrier to that, that inf infrastructure. So uh, you know, those, unfortunately, aren't what a, a member of Congress or a, a senator typically think about when they're asked to write an energy policy. They think about, well, what's, what's popular today? Who's working on interesting things? And how can I help them? And in the long run, that's counterproductive. What do you think of the idea of an emergency plan in effect to, to really go into overdrive and get, get some real things when done? When you say emergency plan to member of Congress, they think uh, in exactly the same terms, but I can spend more money on this bill. Yeah, but I, could, uh, and, I just and, have to tell you, I remember back in the 70s, President Nixon and, and President Ford and President Carter all calling for energy independence. And at that point, we were about 40% dependent on oil. Well, now we're about 60. Well, yeah, I think. Let's back up for a minute and look at this. I echo what Senator McCain said. Most of the folks who have oil around the world don't like the United States. And I don't think that's going to change. I don't see, I'd love to see that change, but it sure as heck seems to have gone the opposite direction over the last decade. Um, I would disagree with Senator Sununu on this. I think there is a very important governmental role, both on the investment side and to some level on the regulatory side. I believe what we need to look at is uh, one, you know, national leadership that recognizes this is more than about high price of gas. We live through one energy crisis. This one's not going to go away. Two, to make that linkage much stronger between energy and, and, and national security and how they are inexorably linked. And three, to make that linkage also to global warming and environmental issues. You know, I'm a Democrat who believes we need to take a fresh look 
have nuclear power. But I believe that also, and, and I'm willing to look at new <coughs> supplies of traditional energy sources. But that needs to be coupled with meaningful environmental reform. That needs to move forward, for example, on clean skies legislation and clean water legislation. That means to look at something that would shake up how we um, approach the automobile industry in terms of trying to be a leader in alternative, fuel, uh, alternative vehicles as opposed to a follower. It but means, and, and what we're seeing right now, because we're, uh, we're not seeing it from Washington, at least on the environmental side, we're seeing the states do it on their own. We're seeing the states in um, New England, for example, step up on emissions. We're seeing in my area, uh, Virginia, for example, has got the toughest clean water standards in the country. We've also made record improvement investments in Chesapeake Bay, coupled that with Maryland efforts, which are led by a Republican governor, at the same time with the federal government stepping back on any investment. So instead of looking at energy policy in these silos, you know, we're going to have the Alaskan oil debate separate from the nuclear debate, separate from the outer continental shelf off the East Coast, which is something we're looking at now, debate, and then have the alternative fuels, environmental, all off on the side. There may be this chance for that grand coalition to really address this issue in a much more macro way, but it's going to have to be driven by, I believe, by national leadership. Would you also be willing to take a fresh look at a gas tax? I think you can't take anything off the table, but I think where you start, where you start is you look at the question of how we can you know, look at alternative fuels, how we can go through a transition. Now, I'm a big believer in alternative fuels, but I don't believe they're going to be ready to replace hydrocarbons in the next five to ten years. So there will be steps in this process. Um, that's something we've got to you know, we've got to step up. One of the things that Democrats traditionally are accused of, uh, you know, is immediately looking at the revenue side. Um, you know, we fixed our finances in Virginia. We cut, we reformed, we were named the best managed state in the country, and yeah, we dealt with, with finances. We had an honest debate about what do you want from state government, what are you willing to pay? And with a two-to-one Republican legislature, passed something that uh, has spurred a tremendous growth and allowed us to make the investments in education and elsewhere. It's that more holistic approach that Again, I think uh, uh, we need to see more of, and this is a, a classic issue, and I would also take one more step that, you know, to even make it more complex. Um, we have in the United States, uh, we have gone from where we were in the 50s and 60s with the best infrastructure in the world, with roads and water and sewer systems, and you didn't even then have the best uh, train systems. But now we have an increasingly aging transportation network an increasingly aging water and sewer and public building network, all that tie back in to a horribly inefficient energy system. So uh, if you're going to really look at those in a broader way, um, to say that you're never going to look at the revenue side, it, but that has to be coupled with the, the cutting side as well, um, I think would be irresponsible. Right. Let's, let's take one final round and then go to the floor very br briefly. The China and India have been very much on the minds of people here in Davos. Uh, and America's almost had an ambivalence toward China, and, and, and that has been, there's been real positive attitudes or China's a place to grow your business, new markets, and all the rest, but there are others who begin to feel threatened by it, loss of jobs. You know, some conservatives talk about it's going to be an eventual enemy. How do we deal with our own, let's put aside what China and India's, how they behave, but how do we deal with our own uh, internal issues to make us more competitive and feel less threatened by these by these countries. Senator McCain. I think that when you look at the economy, which had fourth quarter 4.3 percent GDP growth and a overall national unemployment average, which is quite low, and yet then you look at the polling numbers that show a very large majority of Americans think that we're on the wrong track. We've got a real problem here. We really do. And those average Americans see the crawl across the screen. Ford lays off 30,000 workers, so-and-so 20,000. The traditional American lifestyle of going to work for IBM and staying there 35 years and then having a, a fixed pension are, are over. And it's understandably incredibly unsettling to average Americans, who, by the way, have not seen any kind of a significant increase in real wages 
as our economy has improved. This is one of, you know, you, I, when you were asking me what are the challenges, this was right. one of them that, that, that passed through my mind. And I was in South Carolina uh, recently, surprisingly enough. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, funny, and, so was I. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were a hit. The, uh, uh, but, and, and they have a 7.2% unemployment in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Their textile mills, which was their traditional economic base in that part of South Carolina, are gone. And they know they're, that they're going to be gone. Trade assistant, assistant adjust, adjustment assistance is important. Uh, the, the, uh, obviously, we get down to the fundamental problem, and that's education, to have an educated uh, workforce. Uh, look at our Irish friends. They reformed education, and they've got a booming economy. Now, it wasn't that simple. They had lower taxes and, and a number of other things. But this is the great domestic one of the great domestic challenges is how can we tell workers in America that they can have a reliable future and take part in what is a global economy? Look, we can, we can en enact all the protectionist measures we want to, but we're still going to be in a global competition economically, as, as John articulates better than I do, and we have yet to make the adjustment to it Besides what I just said, a kind of a platitude, we've got to in, in improve education. Well, who disagrees with that? Well, exactly how do we reform education in America to make uh, a more competitive? And I, I'm telling you, I, I'm grappling with this issue, and I don't know all the answers yet, to say the least. But you're working that. Well, Joy, I want to come talk back to, to you smart just a people. Okay. Uh, the, great, um, the great strength of the American economy in the face of uh, the challenges of globalization uh, that, that might be uh, embodied in what we see happening in China and India today, but different countries tomorrow, is that our economy is so flexible, that it's so responsive. Uh, uh, and you can look back at the, the way we uh, handled, economically speaking, the, the shock of 9-11 and the subsequent re recession where our unemployment and, and GDP growth is today. And that flexibility comes from uh, having uh, a good, uh, sound uh, tax and regulatory policy. And I think there is a comparison to, to be drawn uh, to uh, the EU today that uh, countries like uh, France or Germany that understand full well that they are dealing with a challenge of improving the flexibility of their economies uh, dealing with uh, labor, pension, or tax policy that has restricted uh, their flexibility and resulted in much higher uh, institutional rates of, of unemployment. So we want to make sure domestically that we retain flexibility and, la and labor mobility and at the same time uh, on, on an international level continue to press to improve uh, trading conditions, reduce barriers to trade, increase uh, e exchange um, and, and trade opportunities because that is uh, uh, good for our economy, it's good for our consumers, but it will also help to encourage economic growth in our trading partners, which in turn uh, develops them as a market for American goods and, and increases uh, global rates of growth. So I, I think we, if we can focus on those two things and, and try to avoid uh, quote, personalizing this and making it a question of the United States versus the Chinese or, or India versus Pakistan versus China on an economic front, then we're going to enact much more sensible policies. And when, I, yeah, and when sure. I see the last panel that was on here, the greatest minds in the world, John Chambers, Bill Gates, et cetera, then I do have some optimism about, about the future of America's economy. It's remarkable that it happens in America, and I don't mean that in a, in a way that should offend anyone, but there is still the great innovative aspect of America that I think we're all very proud of. Governor Warner, you were chairman of the recent Governor's Summit on Education, especially Reform American High Schools. You thought a lot about this, worked on it, and come at it from a technological background. Well, this is, um, uh, this is the area. There's no place I've spent more time, energy, or effort. And, you know, and I think those who write the demise of the American economy or the American workforce uh, uh, are going to be surprised. I mean, some of these same folks wrote that same prescription with the rise of Japan in the 80s. And I absolutely believe the American worker can compete with anybody. We've got to have the most educated. We've got to have the most innovative. We've got to have the most entrepreneurial workforce around. We're not going to compete on low wages. Um, 
I think we can do that. I think, you know, I believe as a former technology entrepreneur and venture capitalist, you can't stop the free flow of ideas. But I do believe, thinking, raising what John did about the last, last um, um, panel that was up here, you know, something is wrong when China is the second largest purchaser of computer hardware in the world, but 26th in the world in purchasing computer software. Something's wrong in terms of playing with the fair rules. If we're all going to be part of the global economy in a f fair and free trading environment, everybody's got to, one, play by the same rules. Two, one of the concerns that I have is that America is underestimating, underestimating in research and development. Uh, some of our recent visa policies have cut back on our ability to attract some of the most innovative and some of the brightest people around the world who used to come and help spur on American economic growth. Three, I think you know, we can see um, changes in, in education. We have kept very high standards, but matched that with enormous efforts at remediation. We offer now in every high school in Virginia a chance to earn a minimum of a semester's worth of college credit and have it transferable to anybody. Get a jump start, save costs. And for non-college-bound students, a guarantee to earn an industry certification. We ended up with a 94% graduation rate out of our high schools. We've also taken on um, that problem. And here's my real concern, is that we will have in our country, we're already starting to have it, these wide swaths or swaths of prosperity, and then huge swaths of people being totally left behind. I mean, Virginia is a microcosm of, the, of America. We have enormous technology prosperity around Washington, and then industries in the southern part of our state, tobacco, textiles, and furniture, not exactly things you'd go long on, um, where they've just been creamed. You know, what we've done is we have the biggest rural deployment of broadband of any state in the country. We've matched that with relentless focus on education reform. The best day I had as governor was not the day I got my tax package through, was the day we brought 300 software design jobs to a little coal county in southwest Virginia. Those kids had the opportunity to stay in the community they, were gonna, they grew up in. Because unless we can you know, have that focus nationwide, um, then really the, our, our America's ability to compete and America's ability to feel that there is value in this globalization effort that's going to coming at us whether we want to or not will be seriously undermined. But that's going to take, I believe, an enormous renewed focus on starting with education, but also why should America be 11th in broadband deployment, for example, at this point? That, that's crazy. Just a few moments for the floor. I'd love to ask for questions. There's a question right here. I can't quite see whom. I think that's Mr. Evans. Yeah, Gareth Evans from the International Crisis Group to um, Senator McCain and Governor Warner on the question of Iran. Well, nobody but nobody wants to see, under its present leadership, Iran acquire industrial, industrial scale enrichment capability. Isn't it a problem that most of the rest of the world thinks that Iran has a legal right under the NPT to do just that? And isn't it the case for that and other reasons that all the hard options that you both hung your hats on are really pretty lousy, all the way from sanctions through to military action. If that's the case, isn't it in turn time to give some serious thought to a strategy involving diplomatic incentives, particularly bearing in mind that the Europeans who you've supported up until now in a kind of soft diplomacy exercise haven't really had the carrots that are available to you guys. I'm talking not only about negative security assurances, but establishment of diplomatic relations, lifting of sanctions, WTO accession. You've got a whole bunch of carrots in your pocket which could be deployed in getting, arguably, some kind of containment inspection deal which would stretch this thing out. Now, no, but no, no, you don't want to talk about this. There's a sort of bipartisan consensus, just as there was a bipartisan consensus going to the Iraq war, not to give diplomacy of this kind a chance. Is it a possibility that you're going to be making the same mistake twice? Thanks, I think. Um, I do think you have to look at a mixed policy. But this is not a nuclear-armed Iran is not simply a threat to Israel and the United States. I mean, the EU has been very consist consistent in its position as well here. Um, we need to have, keep that common purpose. And clearly your point that uh, if you go the sanctions route in light of the fact that we already have sanctions in place, most of that burden would fall upon more upon the rest of the world. Uh, it's one of the reasons why, at least in the short term, well, I'm not overly optimistic if the Russian option plays out. Um, and I'm pleased to see the President, President Bush, uh, saying let's, let's go down that path. That may be one way out at this point. But would you um, put more carrots on the table? Would you, would you uh, well, I mean, I saw them? today, for example, I saw, I think, in the, read in the newspaper that Tehran was 
um, making an outreach to Washington about possibility of, uh, of restoring air service, direct air service. I mean, I don't think you can take all of those items off the table if you're going to ask at the same time, if we go the sanction route, that the Europeans are going to, uh, at some point, be asked to move to, to broader economic sanctions. Senator McCain, more carrots? Uh, well, first of all, uh, you didn't, s maybe we saw different people that talked before the United Nations, and I saw give a press conference. That, that guy's not interested mm -hmm. in any carrots that I know of. They're interested in acquiring we weapons of mass destruction and dominating the Middle East. And so I think now to say, hey, can we think of some carrots to give you after we have walked this far down in our condemnation of what they've been doing, which is a violation of NPT. I don't see our European allies splitting from us. I'm very pleased that our European friends have pretty much been with us almost every step of the way. Now, they may change their view, but so far, I think the American government is very pleased at what the Europeans have done with us, and I hope that they will stick with us. Uh, look, the face and nature of this regime, which, by the way, is doing everything they can to create havoc in southern Iraq and have been successful in doing so, and oppresses and represses their population uh, and uh, conducts themselves as they have been, I, I, don't, I don't know of any carrot that works. And if now, after we've, we're right at the brink of going to the United Nations for sanctions, say, oh, wait a minute, by the way, here's some carrots. I, don't, I, think, I think you've got a credibility problem then. Yes, please. I'm Cheryl Scott. Um, I'd like to get back to the uh, issue of energy and the environment. Uh, it seems to me that uh, most of the energy legislation has uh, focused on very long-term solutions uh, and also ones that are dangerous to the environment. Um, my husband and I both drive hybrid cars. I get 50 miles a gallon in my Prius. And uh, just that would uh, make a, a, if everybody got 50 miles to the gallon, it would make a tremendous difference in our need for uh, overseas uh, fuel. It, it would also, because they cut off when you're idling, uh, certainly spare the air, especially in our more congested urban areas. I'd like to know why the federal government, aside from some um, minor tax credits for buyers of hybrid cars, why the federal government hasn't taken a more proactive approach in educating the, uh, the drivers of the United States in the benefits of hybrid cars and encouraging uh, Detroit to get more on board. Let me, um, I'd certainly at least like to uh, raise the case of the U.S. efforts to subsidize the development of highly fuel efficient cars. It's called the Partnership for a New Generation Vehicle. It costs $1.5 billion. And the geniuses in our energy department put all that money into developing high performance diesel engines, which turned out not to be viable. A billion and a half dollars, no car ever made it to the showroom. But the real damage that was done is it distorted the flow of private capital as well. And this is primarily where the U.S. automakers were putting their R&D efforts because the federal government was providing a subsidy to that research. And as a result, foreign competitors have a dominant position where fuel efficiency and hybrid vehicles are, are concerned. And it's very disheartening to me to see a case like that where there is a, a, a viable, very competitive technology out there in these hybrids, and, and the, the, uh, it's, a, it's a combustion electric uh, hybrid. And because of clear federal policy, we have lost our place in that competitive frontier. Now, sometimes uh, the federal bureaucracies get it right but they don't get it right as often as the marketplace. And I think that is a, a very important cautionary tale and, and uh, how federal policy can have unintended consequences. We have time for one more question here. 
please. Um, Mr. McCain, um, it seems that you're not happy from any of the results that's coming out of democracies in the Arab world nor in the neighboring countries. I'm overjoyed at Afghanistan, Kyrgyzstan, Lebanon, Ukraine. I'm very happy about a number of areas yes. where there are great would successes. You, is it possible for you to tell us what kind of results would you, have, would you have liked to see in other countries that you're not happy from first? Second, when you're talking about the threat to Israel, do you think that the nuclear bomb would only hit Israel and the Palestinians will not be hurt too, and the Jordanians as well. So why are you so worried about Israel only? Because this is a, a region that will all be hurt. Well, probably, My third question yeah, is that it seems from the news coming from the battlefield from Iraq that uh, the results, the, the outcomes are a little bit different than, than was planned by the American administration. Does the American administration uh, admits or realizes realize that uh, there was a series of miscalculations and lack of uh, proper information in the, at the planning stage of, for the Iraqi war. And are you going to use the same approach in trying to solve the problem with Iran? Well, first of all, in, in response to your first comment, I haven't heard of the Iranians threatening or making as their goal the extinction of Syria or Jordan or Saudi Arabia or any other country. I've only known of them threatening the extinction of the State of Israel at the United Nations, a platform for peace in the world, uh, where the president of Iran made it very clear their intentions. He, he either forgot to mention or didn't include Jordan, Syria, Saudi Arabia, etc., in his uh, agenda for extinction of a nation. So I think that if I were the resident of a country that was targeted for extinction, I would be a little more nervous than, than my neighbors would be. As far as other, ta I think I have been a, a strong critic of many of the mistakes that were made in the conduct of this war. I grieve every night about the needless loss of American blood and treasure because of the mistakes that have been made in, con in the conduct of the conflict. So I feel very strongly that we should learn from our mistakes. And I keep, and I'm sorry to be a little repetitious, but I go back to Afghanistan, where not only NATO is involved, but many nations throughout the world. New Zealand has a team for reconstruction up in Bamiyan. So there's been an international effort to help the Afghan people. I'm very proud that the people of Kyrgyzstan, Lebanon, Ukraine, and Georgia stood up against illegitimate elections and are now asserting themselves in the world. And those are the kinds of examples that I would like for us to follow. So there you have it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Thank I'm you, not sure if we've seen the next president, but there is a very interesting and real possibility that we've seen the next president of the United States here tonight. We thank all three of these gentlemen for coming. Uh, and uh, it, we thank you also for being candid. Very helpful. Gentlemen, thank you. <laughs>